Greetings everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to tackle optimization. We're going to start off by cleaning up some code that we did in the past and then using the optimizer to make it more efficient. So let's jump in. Last time we talked about linkers, and linkers are really helpful for libraries because it allows us to compile each of the files individually and then wait until the very end to kind of combine them and create our final executable. So that way we're not recompiling libraries every single time that we recompile our main code. You don't need to understand linkers to understand this video, so if you missed the last video, you're fine. Before we jump into optimization, I do want to take a sec to clean stuff up that's been bothering me for the past couple of videos here. Specifically, these lines of code here where we set DDRB to 32, port B to 32, and port B to 0. Port B controls these six pins here, which are called PB0 through PB5, and they map to pins 8 through 13 on an Arduino. So anytime that we set the variable or the register value of port B, we're manipulating all of these pins at once. So what happens when we execute a line like this where we say port B equals 32? If you break 32 up into binary, you get this number right here, which is 001 and then zeros all at the end. And that means that we are turning on PB5 here, we're turning on the built-in LED, but we're also setting every other pin to be off. In practice, this is really bad because we're really just trying to turn pin 13 on and off, but while we're doing that, we're manipulating tons of other pins along the way. To demonstrate this, I'm going to take six LEDs and hook them up to pins PB0 through PB5. I'm also hooking up the power and ground lines to our power rails. You just need the ground, but I hooked up power just out of habit. Now that we've got the LEDs hooked up, we can go through one by one and set the pin mode as an output so that way we can turn them on. We'll run through a for loop then and power them on by setting all of those pins high. And then let's wait for three seconds just so we can get an idea of what's going on. And then we will set port B equal to 32. So we expect that this will turn on all of those six pins. But then when we get to this line of code, it will leave pin PB5 on, but all of the other ones should turn off. So here we can see that when our code uploads, all the LEDs turn on for three seconds and then turn off except for pin PB5. Now the question is, how can we change just one bit and leave all of the other ones untouched? So if we wanted to just mess with port PB5, but leave everything else at whatever state it is, how can we go about doing that? This is where we get into something called bit banging, and that's the, usually the process whenever you're trying to deal with individual bits within a number. These are the four operators that I'm going to be using here. We have this vertical bar, which is the OR operator. We've got the ampersand, which is AND. We've got this tilde here, which is NOT. And then we've got this up caret, which is XOR. Let's look at an example of how we can use OR to turn on one bit. So if we've got our original number up here, we've got 1000010, and we just want to turn on this PB5 bit, we could do a mathematical OR operation with this number here, and that's all zeros except for a one where we actually want to turn it on. And then if we perform that operation, we end up with this number here, where we've got just our PB5 bit turned to a one, and everything else stays the same. And you can walk through this piece by piece where you can see 0 or 0 is 0. So neither of those were a 1, so the resulting is 0. Is either of these a 1? Well, yeah, we've got the 1 up top, so 1 or 0 will result in a 1. And then you can carry that whole operation out to see the rest of it. But then when we get here, we see that there is a 0 or 1 will result in a 1. And even if this already was a 1, we would have 1 or 1, well, yes. So then that results in a one as well. So if you execute this operation, it will always turn that pin on. And now one way that you could write this is by taking this binary number here, converting it into decimal and executing that in your code. But there's a better way to do this that I'll show you in a bit. But right now you could say port B equals port B or with the vertical bar here, 32. And the more appropriate way to write this is port B or equals 32. This is the same notation as doing something like I plus equals one. You can do that with bitwise operations as well. Similarly, we can turn one bit off by taking advantage of the AND function. So if we take our original port B here where we've got a one in the PB5 slot and we want to turn it off but leave everything else how it is, we would have to do an AND operation with all ones except we would want a zero wherever we want to turn this bit off. So if we perform that operation over here, we have a zero and one. Are both of these one? No, that's not, so the result is a zero. Are both of these one? Yes, so the result is one. And you can see that that leaves this bottom number unchanged from whatever this top is. But then we get to our special bit here where we have one and zero. Are one and zero both on? Well, no, one's off here, so the resulting will always be off. If you had a zero here, zero and zero is also zero. So no matter what, 
this will make sure that PB5 is off. Now this one's a little weird because you see this number in binary is not so easy to read. We have all ones except for a zero here, and that turns out to be 223 in decimal. And now this is one of the biggest reasons why you need to have a cleaner way to write this. This is where bit shifting comes in. So if we start with a number here that's color coded, and maybe that's the value of port B, you can do something called shifting to the left by executing this command here, port B equals port B and then two less than symbols, one. And that will take every number that's there and shift it over to the left by one bit. And the new spot that it just created in that void will always be a zero. And we can repeat that process for bit shifting two, bit shift three, bit shift four, and this is what that looks like. So if we take that knowledge, then we can start with the number one. If we just do one, it's all zeros and a one. But if we shift the number one, one to the left, we end up with zero, 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 one here. And we could do that two, three, or four times. And as you see, we end up with a number that's all zeros except for a one in the fourth place or the third place. So now if we jump back to our OR example where we needed a one only in the fifth place so that way we could turn on PB5, we could just take one and bit shift that to the left five times. And that gives us our middle number here. So instead of having port B OR equals 32, which is the decimal equivalent of this number here, we can make this code more readable by saying port B or equals one bit shifted to the left five times. So this means one in the fifth bit place. Another thing that we can do is this bitwise not operation. So if we start with one bit shifted to the left, we end up with this number right here. So now if we perform this tilde operation on one bit shifted to the left five times, we end up with the inverse of this. So wherever there was a zero, there is now a one. And wherever there is a one, there is a zero. And this should look familiar because in our AND operation to turn a bit off, we wanted all ones except for a zero where we wanted bit PB5. So this is all ones and a zero here, which means that we just do one bit shifted to the left five and invert that. So once again, instead of using port B AND equals the number 223, which is the decimal equivalent of this binary number, we can make it more readable by saying port B AND equals one bit shifted to the left five inverted. One other operation that you can do is toggling a bit using the XOR operator. So if you were to have all zeros and a one in the spot that you care about, if you perform that operation with an XOR, then it will invert whatever the bit is. So if there's a one to start, it will end up as a zero. And if there is a zero to start, it will end up as a one and all the other bits are left unchanged. So you could do that by saying this XOR, the up caret equals, and then one bit shifted to the left five times. So to summarize, we take one and bit shift it over to the bit place that we care about. And if we're doing PB5, that's five in this example. So to turn a bit on, we do OR equals. To turn it off, we do AND equals with the NOT operation. And to toggle it, we use XOR equals. All right, so let's try this. We're back to our example here where all of the pins on port B are set high or turned on, so our LEDs are all on. And we're going to change up this part right here. So we're going to move this into the loop section, so that way we can do it over and over again. And now instead of setting port B equal to 32, which forces the fifth pin to be on and everything else to be off, we're going to do port B X or equals 1 to the fifth. So now what that will do is that will take this number right here, which is 1 bit shifted left 5, and XOR it, which should then toggle our pin. And we will loop every one second here instead of three seconds, so that way we can see it blinking. So now, all of these pins should stay on all the time, and PB5 should be blinking every second without interrupting the other pins. When we upload our code, we can see that all the lights turn on, and PB5 keeps blinking every second without interrupting the others. Now you might be asking yourself if we just sacrifice performance for readability. Over here, while we're using bitwise operations, we're making a few more calculations. Uh, first of all, we start with the number one and we bit shift it over to the left five and then we load port B from memory and then perform an OR operation on it and then store it back into memory and repeat the entire process again for turning it off, except now we also have an additional instruction in here, the not. So if we were to translate this into some pseudo assembly, it would look something similar to this. Whereas hard coding it should be pretty straightforward. We just store a number into memory and it should be done. Let's take a look at how this affects our code size when we compile it. So over here we use bitwise operations and our program size came to 968 bytes, but here we hard coded it and it's 972. So 
Why is this program smaller than this program? Well, the answer is optimization. So let's take this now and compare it to AVRGCC. Don't get hung up too much on the file size of these compared to the Arduino IDE. I wasn't compiling the exact same program, so I don't expect the file sizes to be exactly the same. The only part to focus on here is that the one on the left is using bitwise operations, whereas the program on the right is using hard-coded values. But the interesting point here is when I compile the bitwise operations, it uses 844 bytes, but the hard coding uses 795. So compiling it using AVRGCC in the command line seems to do better when we hard code it. So why is it the opposite? Well, in this case, we weren't compiling with optimization. So it was following our code and doing exactly what we told it to without trying to make any shortcuts. We can search through the man pages of AVRGCC and search by typing slash optimize and hitting N until we find a section that looks interesting to us. We eventually make it down to this part where it lists off these dash capital O flags. And I put a few of them in here like dash 01, 02, 03. And you can see here what they do is it says optimize and it does some code optimizations. And then 02 is even more and 03 is optimize yet more. But uh, right here it says dash 0, it tells us that this is the default and it makes our compile time short and it makes debugging produce expected results, but this might result in either a slower or larger program. Uh, one that's really common is people do the dash OS, which is optimized for size. This is super useful for microcontrollers because we don't have that much space to work with. So if we can shrink our code size, it means that we can pack more on the microcontroller. Let's see what happens to our code if we compile it again with the dash OS flag. Now let's see what happens if we use the dash OS flag to optimize for file size. For the bitwise operators, we end up with a file size of 705 bytes. And if we jump into our code and swap out the bitwise operators for hard coding numbers like 32 and 0 and then recompile, you can see that we end up with 709 bytes. Now that we added this dash OS flag, our file size got reduced to be about 83.5% of the original size. It used to be 844 bytes and now it's 705. But you might also notice that the winner of the which file is smaller game flip-flopped back over to here. Just like using the Arduino IDE, using bitwise operations results in a smaller file size than hard coding it to 0 and 32. I'd like to say thanks to Andre for telling me about the dash capital E flag. It helped me stumble upon this dash S flag as well. There's a few flags that will tell the compiler to stop early and it allows you to kind of walk yourself through the compile process and see what happens each step of the way. So we've already seen this dash C flag, which means that it's going to compile and assemble, but it's going to stop and not link. But you could also do the dash E flag, which will stop after the preprocessor. So when this is done, you're left with one giant C file that doesn't have any defined statements or include statements, and it does all of the copy pasting for you. And then the one that I care about right now is this dash S flag here, which will stop after compile and leave us with an assembly file. So we can use this dash S flag to see what the assembly code looks like and compare the two programs that we wrote where one uses bitwise operations and the other one uses hard-coded numbers. We're going to compile our code with the dash S flag so we get assembly as an output. We're also going to hard-code the output as hardcoded.asm using the dash O flag. Then we're going to jump back into our code file and replace our hard-coded values with our bitwise operations and compile it again, but this time save it as a different file name so we can compare the two. Now I'm going to use a program called more to look through both of these files. This is a small program, so it was really easy to find the chunk of code that I was looking for. It really stood out because you could see that delay was called twice. So this chunk right here is where I turn the pin on, then I call delay, I turn the pin off, call delay a second time. Same thing goes on over here, turn the pin on, call delay, turn it off, call delay. But if you look at this code, it looks almost identical. The only real difference is that in our bitwise code, we use the set bit instruction, which will set the fifth bit of memory address 5 to a 1, and here we clear it, meaning we set the fifth bit to a 0, whereas our hard-coded value is taking the number 32, since we loaded that up into memory, and storing that value 32 into memory address 5, and here we store a value of 0 into memory address 5. The important thing is that even though we wrote very different looking code, the compiler generates almost identical assembly and it runs almost exactly the same. If you're curious where those four extra bytes came from, that's not actually in our main loop, it's part of the setup. It only runs once at the very beginning and that's where it does this load immediate instruction where it loads a hard-coded value of 32 into register 24 and it loads the hard-coded value of 32 into register 28 
why it does it twice, I'm not entirely sure, but it looks like it uses register 24 for when we set DDRB, the data direction register, equal to 32, and then it uses register 28 when we set uh, port B equal to 32. In the bitwise code, you can see that I still do have a load immediate instruction for 32, and that must mean that I have forgot to change the DDRB hard-coded value, so I must still have DDRB equals 32 somewhere in my source code. But we don't see it equal for the port B, which is uh, red over here, and that's because we use the bitwise operation, so it does save one instruction overall. So overall, what does the optimizer do? Well, here you can see just some of the flags that you can choose when optimizing code. So optimizers do a lot. But if you ask me to describe an optimizer in one sentence, I would just say that it allows us to write some usable code without impacting performance. And it does that by pre-calculating constants. So that way we could type in a math equation if we wanted to. We could say 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 instead of just saying 5. It's also going to make sure that no dead code or unused functions will make it into our compiled code as well. As an added benefit, it's really nice for the microcontroller world because it can squash our program down to make it as tiny as possible so we can pack more onto one chip. And that's it. That's the crash course into optimizers and writing slightly better code. So this pretty much wraps up my fundamentals that I wanted to go over, which means that it's about time to start branching off into other microcontrollers. We could jump right into a completely different brand like STM or PIC, but I'm going to start off with this, which is the ATtiny85. And the reason I'm going to do this is because it's very, very similar to the ATmega328, so it shouldn't be too hard to take the knowledge that we already have and just kind of plop it into here and change a few things. So that'll be our great opportunity to kind of go over everything in review. We can go over what it means to flash the fuse bits, we can compile, we can link, we can optimize, and we can program using AVR, dude. So until then, we'll see you next time.